Today we're going to be hearing from my good friend Ellis Hammond, who was actually a youth pastor for seven years before he got into real estate, and now he's got a nine-figure portfolio. Let's hear what he's got to say. All right, super excited to have you on the show, Ellis. Thanks for coming on, and we're excited to learn about your story. I'm pumped to be here, Chad. Thanks for the honor, brother. Yeah, so so we've known each other for, for a while now. I've definitely been following what you guys have been doing. You've got a really unique story. Um, I was able to learn a lot more about that story, actually, when you were speaking at Raise Fest, um, and you, you dove into your journey. wanted to dive into it a little bit more. And I got a few questions that I never had answered, so I do have a few new ones of stuff that okay. I'm just really interested in learning with you about, and hopefully that sounds okay with you. Love it. You do have an interesting start to your story, which is, you know, being a college, I think college pastor for mm -hmm. seven years or youth pastor for seven years, and then now turn into, a, you know, a, a, a nine-figure real estate mogul and uh just wanted to hear about that journey like how did that transformation happen where did you start and, and how did you end up in real estate i can point back to the moment where it started and it started where i was on the college campus one of the young men like we, we had been doing this for four years at that point had moved out of san diego from south carolina to start this this really missions organization on the college campus and we were completely donor funded, so we were raising all the money we needed to raise, you know, to live, to eat, to fund our ministry, you know, everything. And then we were, we were, you know, we were discipleship based ministry, so we were kind of really, you know, teaching, training, raising up leaders on the college campus. They would come work for us. They would begin to raise their own funds. And so we grew a team pretty quickly to about 15 folks. And I just remember about four years in, it kind of started to get a little bit harder to raise money. And one of the young guys on my team, you know, who was also kind of donor funded, just came to me one day and said, Ellis, I truly don't have enough money this month to buy groceries. And, and that was a really, really hard point for me at that point because I think I was also struggling with raising money. And I also just think was wrestling with this idea of money. And in that moment, literally in that moment, I remember thinking, Ellis, you've completely missed the mark on the idea of money. Because up to that point, it was probably like money was, I, I probably would have almost said like money is evil. You know, like money is something yeah. that I don't really want to be a part of. Like I kind of, I, I would definitely didn't think I was a good steward of it. Not that I'd ever been a steward of it, good or bad. I just like had taken on that assumption, didn't want anything to do with it. And that was like, wow, Um Here's a guy who loves God, who loves other people, who's trying to live out his life with a big purpose. And the one thing he needed in that moment was money. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I just was like, I, and I say this, man, I truly, be, like, I truly mean this because I, when I'm coaching and mentoring others, you know, talk about these decision moments. And even if you don't have the answers or you don't have the path or you don't know, like the most important thing you can do is make a decision. Like I'm going to figure this out or I'm going to be. So in that moment, I made a decision to become wealthy. I'm going to figure out this wealth game. And that was the start. Like that literally that day was the turning point. And dude, I, I like literally a week, two weeks after that moment, I'm driving in the car and I hear a radio ad. If you want to learn how to build wealth through real estate, come to this two hour workshop. <laughs> And like, that's what I went to. And it was actually like a fortune builders thing or something. I don't think I ever ended up signing up for that. But that was the revelation moment of like, oh, you know, the gospel, like the, the, the wealth building gospel of real estate of like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm gonna, this is at least what I'm going to do with my financial future. And, and you know, year, long story short, man, go ahead. What, what year was that? 2017, I think. Okay. And I told you I made a decision, you know, and I moved quick because you know this about me already. So four months later, we had bought a duplex. We had, I'd moved my, me and my wife of eight months into this ugly behind duplex. And we started doing it, man. We started, you know, flipping the project and, and collecting rent checks and the whole thing. And then, you know, nine months later, we were syndicating apartment deals. And we can get into that or not, but, you know, literally, man, in, in the first 13 months, we had li literally bought or purchased $10 million of real estate. 
Now, I wasn't a majority owner of that second deal. I was a very small owner of that project and helped raise capital and co-GP that deal. But I looked up (laughs) and I was managing 146 apartment units. You know, so I was like, oh, I think we're in real estate. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. Was that um, how did that relate with uh, Symphony Capital? Your your uh, yes, yeah, so Symphony now, Arconi Arconi now, are now. So that was Symphony was not. I didn't know the guys. I didn't even know my partners then. Okay. Uh, that was just me and my wife. I was still in college. Man, I was still in ministry, dude. That whole time. So like I had, Symphony, I wasn't. Th- I wasn't even thinking about transitioning, going full time. I still at that point really thought I could be both in full time pastoral ministry and do this. And so Symphony, we didn't really start buying assets together until 2021. We formed that company in 2020, but really didn't probably start buying anything until 2021. So uh, that was just kind of on my own and really learning, you know, just honestly, like learning real estate. Like what is real estate? What is finance, right? How do I invest? How do I begin to talk to investors about owning real estate? So mm-hmm. that was kind of the groundwork, I would say, that that really allowed me, I think, to have enough value to bring to a team like Symphony to, you know, pull my weight in a talented group like we have. So mm-hmm. that was a very much the training ground for me. Gotcha. So was Symphony, Symphony was created between you and some partners. You guys yeah. came together and created a, a, a new entity, new business, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. And, and, um, how has it been? I remember hearing you talk a little bit about, um, you know, trying to raise money through donations for the church. And you had done that for a long time and working with, you know, pretty small dollar amounts, but just really, really talking to a lot of people. And then you kind of transition to, you know, raising chunks of money in $50,000 chunks, $100,000 chunks. What was that transition like? And, and was there any like, like uh, similarities or uh, common denominators between the two approaches? Yeah, I always felt like I've asked for too little, like my entire career, like even, you know, in ministry. But you don't know this until looking back, right? So mm-hmm. it's like when we were in ministry, we were asking, you know, for $1,200 a year, $100 donations a month, you know? And I look back, I'm like, that was so, like, why did I do that? Well, it's because, <laughs> like, that's the, like, that was so grueling, you know? And the reason I did that is because that was the network that I had of, yeah. like, I, that was, and I assumed that's what they could afford. And I also thought that was a lot of money. So there are two things. My network wasn't big enough, and I was only asking for what I thought was a lot of money at the time. Mm. Same thing is true, man, in this business. So, like, our network is too small. We typically go after those who are in similar places as us financially. And then we typically are only asking, or we're only comfortable asking what we're able to invest or what we're able to do. And so what I've had to like, you know, and part of this is just kind of going through this and learning this, but man, I just, every season I kind of look back and be like, you're doing the same thing, Ellis. So it's like, you almost like have to train yourself. Like, okay, how do you get in front of that? Like Mm -hmm. you, you know, and so the way I've, I've been able to do that, you know, where we can ask for bigger and bigger checks and go after bigger and bigger audiences is a lot of times, man, just putting myself in different rooms. You know, I'm, I still feel a lot of times like that missionary kid, man, like the, Mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, the, the, the small minded, you know, the small mindset, um, missionary, missionary kid. But, but, I, but that's not the industry we're in no more, you know? And so like, I, you know, how, how do I, in, in some ways kind of get out of that? Well, for me, it's been, you know, meeting guys like you and, and getting around people who are, who are doing much bigger things. It just allows me to dream. It allows me to realize like, um, yeah, I can I can do more. I can ask for more. That there, there are other people who, uh, you know, m- money's relative. Money really is truly relative based on the, the the people that you're connected to. And so, that's been a real turning point for us, man. That's why I think we've had success in raising a lot of capital too. Is, you know, a lot of folks starting in this business are kind of going to the network asking for fifty thousand dollars. Well, you know, we quickly moved up our minimum because. Like if you set your minimum at 50, let's be honest, like you're attracting a certain type of investor where if you set your minimum at 250, it sets the tone for like, Mm -hmm. these are type of investors we want to work with. You know, this is a sophistication level we want to work with. Um, I remember dude sitting, going to West Texas to present a real estate deal and I sat down 
And I like I didn't even get to meet with the guy. Like I got to meet with like the guy who looks at his investments, you know. And I'm like, he's like, so tell me about the deal. I'm like, okay, you know, tell him about the deal. And I learned this trick. He he said he asked me what the minimum was. And I learned never to share my minimum, but to always ask like what is like turn it back on them, you know. And I'd and I'd say, well, you know, that that's really relative based on kind of folks' needs. Let me ask you this: like, what is what would get you guys like what what do you what is your typical investment size? And he said, Well, we, we really won't even look at the docs under a million dollars. <laughs> you know? And I was like, by the way, that's way beyond my minimum investment. You know, so I'm glad I didn't throw out my minimum investment. But it was a real mind it was open like it was kind of shocking in a good way, like a, a learning lesson yeah. of just this is relative of even if you know, for you, for me or you, or maybe someone listening to the show, like a hundred grand would be significant because that's a majority, that might be a significant portion of your net worth. Where to this family, like it's not even worth the paperwork if they can't allocate a million dollars because mm-hmm. it's just like they got more to allocate. Like, and it, it's, that's not going to move the needle in a significant way. Yeah. And so I, I think that's, that's been really important to learn in, as a servant, as a capital raiser of just like, Hey, what's, what's significant to you is sure our minimum is a hundred or 250 grand depending on the deal. But, uh, let's, let's not talk about minimums. Let's talk about wh- what's going to move the needle for your family. How can I really come yeah. alongside you and help you do that? And I think just changing the framework of the conversation over time has been, is, is really helped me and, and along the way really helped our investors. Yeah. I love that mindset. You know, I, I, I started uh, investing in 2015 and I did my first syndication in 2019 and I was kind of hemming and hawing about how much to, you know, make my minimum. And I was, I did it as a solo GP. So I was the guy making all the decisions. And at first I'm thinking, okay, should I make it 25K or 50K kind of, you know, going back and forth with my first deal, blah, blah, blah. And then kind of talking with some other people and saying, you know, better to go bigger sooner and go bigger faster. And I'm like, all right, well, I'll make my minimum 100K for my first deal. And I was really nervous about it uh, just because I'd never raised any money before. But we filled it up. It was 100K. And um, I was the only only capital raiser. I think we raised uh, maybe 1.2 million on that uh, first deal. Uh, so it was a smaller deal, but but I did everything and, uh, and I'm like, wow, okay. They were okay with a hundred K. And, uh, and so it was just a, a learning experience for me. Um, and I've seen other people kind of moving along that journey, uh, as far as general partners, yeah. you know, uh, on increasing the minimum. Well, like even now, so, and just what I've learned too, I mean, there are things that maybe we'll have a lower, you know, where I've learned from, a, from an investor standpoint, some folks do want to kind of come in and check things out. And so, like we we have a we have a fixed income opportunity right now where our minimum is fifty. So someone could come in and, and invest for fifty. And the nice thing about that is like they start earning a dividend almost mm. immediately. It's great for both of us because they see okay, this works. I've invested with this company and I'm starting to get a check. And I only had to put in a little bit. So now they're like, okay, I want more of this. So let's go to other opportunities. And those opportunities, the minimum is going to be a lot is going to be significantly higher there, right? And so. I do think from a business standpoint, if there's maybe GPs listening to this or capital raisers listening to this, I do think there's something to having an entry point. The minimum again doesn't matter. I think I think get the first thing something come, like the first thing someone comes into more than minimum. I think are results. Like how fast can you get someone results? Mm-hmm. Because if you can get someone results fast. And they see that it works. That second, mm-hmm. third, fourth check is going to come a lot. Is going to come quickly, right? Where, um, and that was probably also another mistake we made early on. Man, we did a lot of like really heavy value add deals, where we're two years in and we still haven't done a distribution on some of those deals. So a lot of those investors are saying, "Okay, Ellis, I've, I, I try, you're, you're operating the deal fine. It's going great. We're according to business plan, but like I haven't seen anything." Yeah. And you know, well, where if we would have done like a debt fund, you know, that would have paid a 10% note, we probably yeah. would have gotten, you know, future investments from these folks because we would have paid them something. So that's been another learning curve too, man, of just like, how do we have offerings, lower, higher minimum, it doesn't really matter, but gets people results quicker. 
so they see, hey, okay, I see how this works. I see if I invest, I get money back, and that's going to give me more. That's going to make me more comfortable. Yeah, I see how you communicate. So like mm-hmm. that's a, that could be a benefit to having a lower minimum early on to something like a debt fund or a fixed income fund, where folks just get familiar with your communication. They get familiar with mm-hmm. your due diligence. They get familiar with your process, right? And so, um, anyways, that's a free tip for maybe those listening who are kind of getting into this business. Yeah. I've also noticed uh, consistency is key as well, whether it's communications or distributions. Totally. Uh, consistency yeah. is huge. You know, like yeah, investors, we, we report- they, don't, they don't like things out of left field, right? They want to they want to know ahead of time what's going on and, and consistency. Yeah, we, we report on the 20th of every month. You know, it's what it's just it's a number for them and for me. You know, I, I know 18th or 19th rolls around and I haven't written those investor reports. It's like, OK, I got to sit down and write a report. And so yeah. that consistency is helpful for everybody. Yeah. Cool. So what is what is your uh, portfolio look like now? Where are you guys located? What kind of asset classes? What what does it look like? Yeah, we're we've been multifamily guys since the, you know, start of 2021. We we've purchased um I would say a a mix. You know, we got probably better looking as we went on. <laughs> this is the best way to describe it. Uh we own from San Diego to to um Dallas. And kind of everywhere in between, so we, San Diego, Kansas City, uh, and then across Texas. And yeah, I mean, the best way to say it is like I think we got better looking as we as we got older. You know, some of that was as the market was shifting. You know, and things were getting more expensive. You know, you you're you're kind of getting away from the C class kind of heavy value add stuff, mm-hmm. where if everything's compressed why would we be buying this heavy distress class c stuff let's start buying a little bit nicer stuff so the last 500 units we purchased were class a class b uh vintage assets where some of our earlier properties were pretty heavy value add value add midwest type deals um and kansas city market was a market we bought a few deals in uh for example so yeah about 1200 apartment units across the West and Midwest states, all multifamily. Um, our most recent transaction being in Dallas, and it's a market we really like. Would love to own some more deals there, you know. And um, starting to really kind of build out a presence in Dallas. So we 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 own. We just bought a great deal up in North Dallas uh, back last year, and so um, that's majority of what our portfolio is today. Gotcha. Cool. Um, and it, it's been, uh, you know, some ups and downs, a little bit of a bumpy ride the last 12 months. You know, all of us operators, syndicators have felt that. How, how have you, like, personally dealt with the ups and downs and maybe tied in a little bit with faith? Like, like for you personally, how have you dealt with it, the ups and downs over your career? Still figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, listen, man, I, no one's going to come unscathed. Through this and if anyone gets on the show and tells you like oh you know they're freaking lying um <laughs> you know I, I, so i'll just be real i mean I, I feel if i if i this is something i'm learning right now as a man of faith if there's what i've learned in looking back over the last three years is that i i can accomplish a lot just going really hard like Probably like you, you know, like we we could push our way through life. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of grace involved in that. God's got to give us health. God's got to give us strength. God's got to give us connection. But by brute force, we could also push a lot through, you know. Um, there, there's something to that. And looking back over the last couple of years, a lot of my energy has been brute force. The problem with doing it that way being self-made is that you also don't realize man like because you're so eager to get success you're so eager to get results kind of the baggage you pick up along the way and that baggage comes in the form of bad business partnerships right that baggage comes in um maybe for many of us in this in this industry bad debt like finance debt right where you 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 didn't think about that strategy wholly um or fully and so yeah, when I look at the last three years, this is these are not going to be devastating decisions per se to me or my investors, but a lot of the stress, a lot of the anxiety, or I would say the, the allocation of stress and anxiety in my life, I can look back and say, 
you know, those were not decisions where I waited on God. Those were not decisions that I really, um, I really just took time to pray and wait and, and seek the Lord and, and what he was doing. In fact, I probably started to feel the inclination that the Lord was saying, don't do that or go here instead. Mm-hmm. But because I was just, I'm going to get this done, we still went for it. And so now it's more a prayer of protection versus a prayer. You know what I mean? You, you, you get what I'm saying there, right? Where it's like, okay, God, I look back and I repent. Like, I, I know I'm learning now that I, that is my inclination just to go push, go push. And I see what that brings. Like, I see, I see, like, because... Because now that I realize that it doesn't just mean, hey, I can gotta, I can get rid of some of these relationships, right? Or I can get rid of some of these obligations that we have. No, you still are a steward of that. Like you, you've taken that on because of the decisions we've made. And so to answer your question, man, I, I, I'm calling this like a pruning season, <laughs> right? Where there's there's relationships being pruned in my yeah. life, business partnerships being pruned. There's opportunities that are being pruned. Um, you know, we hope to be able to. You know, we're working on you know finishing up some of these deals and unloading some of these deals um, at a better time to kind of you know get rid of some of those obligations that we have. And so that's the best way I can explain it. Is I just I, I I'm not one to move slow, but I want to move. Like I want to be God made, I guess is the best way to describe it. Like I don't want to get to you know the pinnacle of my career, but look what I built. No, man, I want I want unexplainable results. Like I want amazing, massive, huge results that I can't take credit for. And that's that's kind of what I'm trying to build in this next season. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I'd say you're you're well on your well on your way there i mean you know you've done amazing things for a long time um you've been outspoken about being a man of faith and and something i admire and wanted to kind of get in your head a little bit on that and figure out you know that that connection and kind of developing that relationship over time with god and developing it pruning the relationships with other people is is a an interesting metaphor so, uh, so yeah, it's 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 good to hear. Uh, I, I appreciate that. How has it changed? Because I know now you're you're uh, a father of two, right? You just had a young yeah. boy, I believe, a few months ago. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so has that changed at all? I mean, now you're a dad of two young kids, and what's that like, dude? You, I mean, you 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 get it, man. It's uh, <laughs> I, I'm just like I owe so much to my wife. Um, who, you know, she was, you know, because because of our success over the last couple of years, we've, you know, we have the freedom and the option for her to not necessarily have to go back to work. And so that's been a huge blessing. Um, we live out here in San Diego, so we don't have a ton of family. So, I mean, bro, I just, I take no credit for, like, for me being able to do what I do full time and, and the focus I'm able to have because my wife is doing so much with our kids right now. Um, yeah. But no, I, I wouldn't say that's, I mean, I love being a dad. I, I would say the the joy of like having a two year old and a thirteen week old in the midst of a very stressful and t- and um, tiring business season, right? Where it feels like, man, this will never end. That juxtaposition, you know, of like, man, I can go, you know, I get home or I go upstairs when I'm working from home and being with my kids, you know, like it, it, it's a relief. Like my home is a safe place. You know, mm-hmm. it, and that feels good to be able to come home to that and play and have joy. The I think that's kept me kind of sane, <laughs> you know, in 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 a lot yeah. of this. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, it's probably the best, but I, I wouldn't say it's changed a whole lot. Like I know some people say, "Oh man, I had kids and like it changed my whole reason for doing things." That's not really been the case for me. I don't think my kids yeah. are the reason I do things. I love my kids. Um, but like, to be honest, man, if I really would want to spend more time with my kids or if like, I probably wouldn't do this other stuff, you know what I'm saying? Like I probably wouldn't be in this. So I think I'm driven by a little bit more than just that because if it was all about my kids, dude, I'd I'd probably just go get a decent paying job so I can spend more time with my kids. Um, so that's kind of how I think about that. 
Uh, I'm envious of your safe space because I got I have four girls and a boy and two of them are teenagers, so I don't have a safe safe space at home, man. I get beat up at home <laughs> mentally. I get mentally, Dude, you're by gonna, the that's teenagers. another season, by man. The I can't wait for that Ooh. though. That sounds fun. That sounds crazy at the same time. Uh, you're right. So my kids are 12 weeks old and two years old. So uh, they're yeah. in bed by seven o'clock. So we get our you know our night time and. Dude, I, I don't know how you do it. That is wild. Uh, the struggle is real, man. Let me tell you. So my oldest is 17. So the teenagers, they'll stay up until, you know, midnight or 1 a.m. And then my youngest is a year and a half. And um, so the young, I got three younger ones and, and they get up at like 6 a.m. So like really like from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m., the house is quiet. <laughs> but the problem is it's only five hours of quietness. So yeah, it's it's Jeez. it's pretty it's pretty brutal, man. The struggle is real right now. <laughs> yeah, Jeez. you need like um, a quiet room. Like that's what you guys uh, need. Like a you know, or like one of those signs. You know, like you like you flip on the the neon light and like it's quiet time and like yeah. no one can talk. Yeah, well, that I mean, look, I, I've done quite a bit of Hollywood work and and TV work. That works in Hollywood. Here, I need like some electrified sign so they touch the door <laughs> and they get electrocuted. <laughs> yeah. I need something like next level yeah. besides just the sign. But uh, but let me ask you uh, another uh, real estate question before we start wrapping things up. Um, you know, it's we've had interest rates skyrocketing, uh, a lot of uncertainty on the debt side of things, cap rates changing. What are your thoughts on like the next 12 months, maybe 12 to 18 months? Like where do you see things headed in the, the multifamily space? Because that's what you guys specialize in. And uh, are you guys planning on buying, holding, selling? Like what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, I, I, it's hard to, to say really. I, I mean, I think a lot of it's going to stay pretty tight for... I would say this: it's a huge relief that the Fed paused interest rates. I think that's a that's the first step in them starting to cut interest rates. Um, and I, I do think you know just being in this industry, having no, having deals that are that are on floating rate debt, you know, and and being involved in other deals or seeing other sponsors. Trust me, dude, that was a huge relief. Like I was talking to a group the day before that, and they're like, "Hey, depending on what happens tomorrow, our rate cap could either be." A million dollars, or it could be three hundred thousand dollars. Jeez, right? So, like that—that's significant money on a syndicated deal. Where, like, you didn't yeah. just raise an extra seven hundred thousand um, dollars mm-hmm. for a rate cap, and because and now, if, because think about that—if they couldn't afford that, now their now their interest rate maybe was at five, but then instead of buying a two percent rate strike, they have to go up and buy like a four percent rate strike. So now they're at like seven, seven and a half. Okay, yeah. most deals actually probably don't pencil at that anymore, right? Because yeah. of the, the how much the debt costs. So like, it's hard to say, man, because I just don't know. What, like, I just don't know what the Fed's going to do. Um, I yeah. think if we can stay steady and even start to cut rates and prices go down on some of these rate caps, and guys can continue to, to buy themselves out of this, though I think I don't. I, I don't know if we'll see as much hurt as maybe people are, are planning, um, at least in the multifamily space. The Fed comes back and starts jacking up rates, you know, through beginning, middle of 2024. A lot of people are going to be hurting. I mean, yeah. I, deals are, people are, people are, let me just say this, deals are already hurting. In the sense of like, people are stopping distributions. They've cut distributions, right? Like they're, they're, you know, everybody's just saying, hey, we're preparing for the worst. Yeah. But I feel like most folks, a majority of people I know and the industry in itself can survive unless the Fed comes back and says, no, we're going to keep we're going to keep trying to fight this thing because that just has repercussions yeah. in so many other domains, you know, with uh you know if you even think about trying to sell a deal right now like if rates keep going mm-hmm. up it just is harder to finance deals right like the, the next buyer can't come and get good financing if you're trying yeah. to keep a deal your rate cap or if you have a floating rate interest rate and you're trying to buy like that insurance cap that's going to get more expensive yeah. so it's hard to tell you the answer i'm just telling you like let's all hope and pray for everyone in this industry, you know because dude it, it totally impacts not just the, the owners of these groups like me but it also in, impacts the billions of dollars, the the thousands, if not, I don't know, maybe millions at this point 
of retail investors that are invested in this space. Yeah. And I hope for everyone's sake that that it goes the other way because you know I I, I have I know a lot of people that are invested in this space and yeah. I want you know I don't I don't want there to be a lot of pain. And so yeah, my hope is that the, the Fed does start to kind of slash back, things start to come down, it starts to open up financing for people um, where transaction volume can increase. And that's my hope. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but that's, you know, I think it would be interesting yeah. if someone's listening and you want to, you want to know if more pain is coming or not, watch, just watch what the Fed does. Cause I think that's going to be yeah. a big, big determination. Is uh symphony capital group. Are you guys still planning on buying? Or are you guys paused on the sidelines? What are you guys doing? We, so we just rolled out a new, uh, a new opportunity. It's a 12% fixed income share class, uh, so that's our one opportunity right now where someone could come in and start earning an immediate uh, dividend uh, right away. And then a piece of that is accrued as well. So it's a net return of 12% a year. And so, you know, doing some interesting things like that, uh, mm -hmm. that I think, you know, it's a prep position. So, you know, on deals. And so it, it's kind of a low risk alternative option for folks. It's not the blended 15 or 18, 20%, but you're getting half of it right away and so you know some a lot of our investors have enjoyed seeing things like that so we're not be, we're doing stuff like that because we're not really aggressively pursuing deals i mean we it's hard to right now we we really are hamstrung like a lot of people i mean 70 yeah. percent less transactions on market year over year right e even in dallas and so that's pretty significant so uh and, and we raise a lot of our money from from individual you know retail type investors and a lot of those mm -hmm. folks are holding back as well and so that that maybe prohibits a lot of what we can do in the future too so no i mean we're we got plenty of work on the deals we have bought to manage and to make sure we're doing well uh we do have a few opportunities like this 12 percent income share class i was telling you about but um still hope to do you know another one or two deals this year but but not aggressively trying to expand our portfolio rapidly fast at this moment yeah yeah, we're still doing deals. Um, <clears throat> obviously, really focused on debt. You know, we got to make sure pencils with the you know longer term fixed rate debt, and um, and and sellers are are meeting us now. You know, before a year ago, you know, best and final offers is what was on the table, but now, you know, sellers are are coming to the table, willing to to you know discount their asking price, and uh, and and we're actually seeing some deals out there. And as long as as long as we can get it to cash flow, and we're in long term debt position, um, we're pulling the trigger. And so we're yeah. we're still buying right now. Yeah, but we're also doing self storage, as well as multifamily, though. Yeah, I mean, and as you should be, man. If you have capital to be able to deploy and can do that, I think it's a great yeah. time to be in the market. But you know, it does come down a lot to debt, and you know the type of debt access you can get to, and then of course, like, does that make sense? Um, from an investment standpoint, and in a large multifamily, you know, which is what we're our bread and butter, a lot of that doesn't work at the moment, you know, and so yeah. you know we're also, I, you know, so I, we're okay to be patient. Is my point, you know, we we yeah. don't, um, again going back to like I've forced a lot, <laughs> you know, like I've forced a lot in my career. I think I think I'm okay to just kind of like. Let's look around. Let's see where the opportunity is. We're still communicating with our investor base. I know people, you know, so like the 12% thing's gone gone really well. That's something that's been unique, hearing from what our investors want. You know, they don't they don't want the seven pref that pays 2% right now and a blended, a maybe blended 15 or 18% return mm -hmm. on their money. Like, no, they, they want income right now, you know, and they want to be in a position that's pretty secure and is kind of a void from volatility in the market. So that's what we, that's what we provided. And and so it's kind of just kind of keep a pulse on both. Where are investors at? Where's the where's the market at right now? And then kind of how do we, you know, as entrepreneurs, as problem solvers, really try and try and bridge that gap. So we'll yeah. continue to do that. And if things open up later this year, yeah, we'll we'll get back in, man. Um, that's kind of where we're hovering right now. Yeah. Great. Well, before I let you go, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Kingdom REI. Yeah, dude, that would be a total. Uh, Totally different path, but we, uh, that is a, you know, when I got into this business coming from pastoral ministry, man, I had, um, I didn't really have a community. Like I didn't know where to turn in the sense of like, I, I was someone who's passionate about my faith. I wanted a space where I could continue to be passionate about my faith, but also like 
be ambitious and be entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. especially in the world of real estate. So Kingdom Our Guys started as like this small group of Christian men and women in real estate. And it was kind of like a mastermind and we would meet a couple of times a year, you know, and meet virtually and and then that grew and grew and grew. And so today we have, you know, multiple paths to, you know, for kind of wherever folks are at. I mean, it's really a, a faith based group of folks who want to break into commercial real estate investing. And so we have education, you know, where we actually teach people how to go and find off market deals, especially kind of in the small to mid size um real estate deals, you know, five to let's call it 80 unit apartment deals. That's a bread and butter of ours that we can really teach and help people break into. We teach them the skill of raising capital uh, so that they can kind of learn a profitable skill. And then we provide them with a community, you know, of other Christian minded leaders, entrepreneurs, real estate investors. And so uh, that's, it's a for-profit company. So it's a, it, you know, something you pay to be a part of. But dude, it's so much like a ministry too, man, where we, you know, it it really is a place where I continue to get to pour into. And, you know, on Tuesdays, man, we do like a, a, a worship hour where we do live worship. I get to share a message. Like it feels like church. So it's, uh, it's cool, man. It's, it's, it's a really good outlet for me as well. Um, in in a great company. So if anybody wants to learn about that, that's kingdomrei.com. Yeah, super unique. I mean, I, I think that's a, a big void that, that you're filling there, which is great. So are you guys still accepting new members? Yeah, yeah. So we uh, – we uh, if you go to KingdomRI.com, you can learn about that. One connection – well, let me just say KingdomRI.com, yes, we are accepting new members. Or if you're someone who's interested and maybe just learning how to do deals, like you you're, you you want to learn the skill of you know doing what Chad and I do, of putting together funds or maybe going out and finding smaller apartment complexes to take down on your own. We have programs uh, that are that are very affordable to help you get started in that. So that we just go to kingdomrei.com. You can fill out an application, um, and the only way to really kind of learn about any of our programs is to get on a call with someone on our team, so that we can kind of assess, hey, wh- where are you at? What do you really need? And kind of you know figure out a program for you. So kingdomrei.com be the place for cool. that. And if uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you or Symphony Capital Group if they're interested in investing or following you? What what are the best ways? Yeah, totally, man. I mean, I think you know, as you know, this like part of what I love doing is just sitting down with individuals who you know have capital to allocate. They want to be intentional about that money. You know, they want to align their values, their faith with their investment opportunities. So you know, that's probably not just going to be coming online and like clicking on an investment deal and like wiring funds like it's going to take a conversation so i i'd love to have a conversation with anyone listening um the best way to to get on my calendar is just to go to symphonycapitalgroup.com and there is the opportunity to get started on our website and that will take you through a three or four question um thing you know name email phone number and then and then bump you to my calendar so uh, that would be the best thing to do and that would just be a, a blueprint call between you and me to discuss, you know, where you're at, how I can help. So symphonycapitalgroup.com or email me, ellis at symphonycapitalgroup.com. You know, that's how you get me directly via email, but I'd love to, you know, I'll probably point you back to (laughs) the calendar page. So symphonycapitalgroup.com. And then, uh, Chad, we also have a podcast. You know, this if you're a podcast listener, Kingdom REI Podcast is our podcast show uh, where we interview, um, you know, faith-based professionals, real estate entrepreneurs, authors, etc. cetera, uh, every single week on the Kingdom Mario podcast. So if you're a podcast listener and, and have enjoyed the show, go check that out. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, this has been uh, super helpful and, and very insightful. I love learning more about you and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Go, uh, go right. take care of those teenagers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Get back to my safe space. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. We'll talk yeah. soon. Thanks so much. All right. All right. Bye. All right. You've heard it from Ellis going from collecting $100 donations to $100,000 investments. He's got the blueprint for it. And if you want to learn more, check it out at kingdomrei.com. If you want to hear about what CSQ Properties is doing, go ahead to csqproperties.com and drop us a comment below. Let us know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe for more of our videos. Thanks a lot.